We all know there are a million different ways to make a living, but on this show, we are curious about those businesses that you might not know about. We're going to take a deep dive every week and talk to a successful person in their field to learn about how they got their start and how they continue to make it in their space. Join me and learn more about the business of. Welcome back to the business of, and today we are learning about the business of baseball bats. We've got Pete Tucci here from Tucci Lumber, and we've got a really exciting story to tell. Can you tell us how Tucci Lumber came to be? So, uh, give us the story. I will. So, <laughs> it's kind of a little bit of a long one, but uh, ex professional baseball player, I got done playing in uh, 2002. Um, Came home, didn't know what I was going to do the rest of my life. Kind of, I left school early and to play pro ball and mm -hmm. uh, kind of got married, had a kid. By the time I got done playing baseball, it was kind of, I never went back, finished my degree. So it was kind of, what am I going to do now? So at the time, my brother-in-law was looking to start uh, a business. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and so I decided to partner with him and we went into the residential heating oil and kind of service industry um, around that and doing heating and air conditioning and that kind of stuff. Not knowing anything about it, never worked with tools in my life, not really con considering myself any type of handyman by any means. Um, kind of went into business with him and, and kind of set out on this journey that over the next few years taught me how to use my hands, use tools. In a different way. It, 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 yeah, <laughs> you're other than hitting a baseball, yeah. right? So, um, so kind of like it really kind of gave me the skills needed and like it, it's funny looking back how much of those skills i learned in those years that i actually put into use starting this business um but uh we did that for a period of nine years together seven years together i think anyway so uh it kind of became evident though that I, like something was missing in my life sorry so my whole life was up until the time i got done playing ball was was baseball um, and then when that dream kind of didn't come true, it was kind of really tough for me to handle and going on to something completely different in life was definitely needed at that point. I had to take that break and step away and kind of do something new with my life, but there it always kind of felt like something was missing. So my wife came to me one day, uh, this is about 2009 and just said, listen, I think there, you got to find a way to get back into baseball. You're, you know, definitely have lost passion in life and you're not the same person you know I married and and we really have to think about a way you can get back into baseball. My answer to her was I don't have time to coach, I don't have time to do lessons with owning and operating the the heating and air conditioning air conditioning business with my brother-in-law, they just didn't leave a lot of time in my day. Um, and anything I did around baseball, coaching, lessons, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff would have taken me away from my family when I was able to see them. Yeah. So that kind of really didn't seem like it was just, I was content to say, not that I was content, but content to say like, this is my life now. Like I just have to deal with it and, and baseball is not a part of it anymore. And she kind of started without talking to me about it, looking down this road of starting a, a, a bat business. And she started researching different woods, lathes, all this kind of stuff. So about two weeks later, she said, I really think you ought to give a shot at making bats. And I said, what makes you think I know how to make a bat? Like I've never made a bat in my life. I, never took any kind of wood shop course in high school or anything like that. Like, I don't know the first thing about making a bat. I know what I like from a bat. I know, you know, I definitely had high opinions on what I would do differently on bats I've used over the years, but mm -hmm. never knew the first thing about the tools needed and that kind of stuff. So she kind of said, you well, know, I've kind of been looking into this and she ordered a lathe and like <laughs> she spent about, I'd say about four grand on the initial setup okay. uh, and said, listen, try it. If you like it, great. If not, like, it's not going to make so or like break So like set up us. in your garage, this in our garage, like yeah. for so, you to try and. So this, you know, lathe gets delivered to the house. Uh -huh. She sets up an appointment with, um, there's like a woodworkers club by our house. So she sets, she calls them. She's like, the guy's expecting you to go down. He's going to give you like at least a 20 minute tutorial on how to use them, you know, the lathes and not to, you know, make sure you don't take any fingers off or anything. So <laughs> important. <laughs> so, uh, so I went there, he kind of, you know, gave me this quick tutorial on how to use different tools and, and I went home and 
literally that first night made my first bat, which took me about three hours to make, but came out pretty good for what I expected to make on my, on my first run. The next day I showed it to a few people, they liked it, and it wasn't before long where I started getting orders for local people to, to start making bats. Wow. So it's kind of like, it was nice because I would, I would go to work during the day, come home, spend a few hours with my family, kids would go to bed, and then I would go in the garage and just kind of chill out and kind of, it was very therapeutic to sit there and make a bat by hand mm -hmm. and just be alone with your thoughts like throughout this whole process and reflect back on my playing days and, and all that kind of stuff and kind of set me out off to like a new chapter in life where it, it really helped me get closure on like my playing days and really get over that end of it. So, but it never really intended to get more than like this kind of side business and a way to get back into baseball. I still owned and operated the, the heating business with my brother-in-law and it was just a way to get back into baseball. Um, unfortunately, that following March, my brother-in-law passed away uh, unexpectedly of a heart attack at 38 years old. I was 34 at the time. And when that happened, um, it kind of shook me because it was like, you know what, life's too short to not do what you want to do. And, kind of had this really small bat company I was running out of my garage that I had very local, like 12 year old kids I was making bats for. And had the idea that I want to start making bats for major league players and, and kind of build up that part of the business. My brother-in-law was really the brains behind the heating and air conditioning business. And I kind of did like the back end stuff and anything he taught me on the front end was, mm -hmm. you know, he taught me, but he obviously knew most about it. So I just didn't feel confident at that time that Within two years, I felt like people's sympathy are only gonna last so long to like stay with us and sooner or later, they're gonna get somebody who knows more about their heating system than I did. So I kind of said, you know what, I wanna, you know, I know baseball, I was more mm -hmm. confident in that field and talked to my wife about it and said, I wanna sell the heating company and, and go into the bat business. And she agreed and, uh, and that's what we did. We sold the bat business, put all the proceeds into uh, we sold the heating business, put all the proceeds into the bat business and kind of set out on his journey to kind of reshape our life around this business. Now I had to, when we sold the business, I sold it finally in December of 2010, the heating business. I had to run it for the new company mm. for a year um, to kind of like this transition period. So mm -hmm. that took us to December 2011. Um, in that meantime, we moved the, the bat business out of my garage. We leased a small shop uh, about a mile away from our house on, on kind of a main strip in Norwalk. And um, I've, I would go to work during the day for the heating company, who was a few towns over. My wife would go man the shop during the day and I taught her how to paint the bats and I'd go in at night and I would make the bats and she would go in and paint the bats the next day and if any uh, customers came in, she would, she would help them out. We did this for a year. Very cool. Um, when I finally was out of that business altogether and can finally put my full attention to the bat business, uh, we got an LB approved like right away. So we, this was 2000, December 2011, we were done with the heating business. January 2012, we got approved for MLB. So what is that approval process like to be MLB approved? Um, I'll be honest with you. Originally, it's just a check. Like it's, you write a check, you fill out an application, <laughs> And nothing is really done until you actually are making bats for major leaguers. And okay. then they come and inspect everything and make sure you're doing everything correctly. But that first, like I was kind of shocked at like, it's like, as long as I write a check, <laughs> like we're pretty much in, but. Um, and how did you get MLB players to want your bats? So my first idea was to go to guys who I knew right. from my playing days. Yeah. Um, and uh, off the air, we were talking a little bit about that earlier, yeah. but that kind of backfired in my face. So um, my college roommate, John McDonald, uh, played together at Providence College, was playing in the big leagues and kind of saw him and started talking to him about bats. What, what kind of model do you use? I'd like to send you some samples to try. He was very vague and reluctant to try <laughs> our, our bats. And, uh, at the time, I thought it was pretty strange that he didn't, you know, he couldn't remember what model bat he swung or what size bat he swung. Uh, but then talking to a mutual friend after the fact who, who they had a conversation, mentioned to me that he was reluctant to try because if he didn't like it, how would he tell me he didn't mm. like the product? Which I understood. Um, so at that point, I made it a, 
I kind of changed my approach and decided to go to nobody I knew and only approached players who didn't know me as a player, didn't know me as a friend, only knew me as this new kind of bat maker on the scene. And that seemed to work because then it was all on the credibility of the product and nothing. Um, and I kind of preferred it that way as well because I think I would have been second guessing the product had it not been, you know, if, if a friend started using it right away. Right. So I didn't approach any friends until year two of our MLB existence. Uh, but in year one, we ended up with 55 players in Major League Baseball using our bat. So wow. um, we kind of hit the ground running at that level. Uh, in our first years, 2012, um, five players in the World Series were using our bats. Uh, at one of the players, Marco Scudero, hit the uh, game-winning hit in game four to sweep the Tigers in the World Series, and that bat got sent to Cooperstown. So in year one, we had 55 MLB players and a bat in the Hall of Fame. Whoa. So, That's pretty cool. Yeah, so we kind of hit the ground running at that <laughs> level. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we're going to learn more about how you were able to build Tucci Lumber into the success it is today. So welcome back to the business of baseball bats. We've got Pete Tucci here from Tucci Lumber. And so let's continue talking about your bats and exactly what sets them apart and why do MLB players specifically really res like they love your bats so much? Um, so there's a couple things we do in, in the process and kind of started those early days in my garage of kind of tinkering and, and pretty much the process I came up with that goes into our bats is, is pretty much the same today as it was in those early days um, in my garage. Uh, so as a player, one of the things I did uh, which was kind of common practice, you know, with some players called bone rubbing the bats. So I would take all my bats that like when they, when they were ordered and, and before I was able, before I got high enough and, and put on the 40 man MLB roster and was actually getting custom bats made, we would just kind of take stock bats from, from, the, from the stock room. I would take my bats back to my apartment, sand them all down to a bare finish and I would get a, a piece of a femur bone from a cow, from a butcher boil all the meat off of it what? and and <laughs> compress the the wood of the bat with with the, with the bone from the cow and that is normal practice this was normal practice for for some players at the time but no bat company was ever was ever doing this okay um and so and i swore it made a difference it definitely compressed the wood so and, and you could hear and feel the difference in the bat from bats that were that didn't have this process done to bats that did have this process done. And I remember always saying, like, I wish a bat company would just do this for you. Yeah. So there was a bat company that, well, they're still in existence and they're pretty big, but in 2003, a bat company started doing this. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, at that time, I thought it's about time somebody kind of took this practice and started taking all the hard work out for the players and just, yeah. and just did it, you know, from the, from the start. But... So this was something I definitely wanted to do with our bats because some I did as a player anyway, and, and I kind of wanted to bring at least my knowledge as a player and kind of marry that with the knowledge I was now gaining as a bat manufacturer to kind of bring that together to give players what they want. Um, what I really quickly discovered in my garage was when I wanted to do it, I never had the power of machinery before. Right. Now I have with the power of a lathe and RPMs and a bone under that much RPM and pressure pretty much disintegrates and burns and kind of oh. doesn't do the job I wanted. I also have a gym at my house. So I had, I went downstairs and got a, a lat pull down bar from the gym okay. and started using that to, to what well, we kind of coined the phrase called steel burnishing. So we steel burnished the bats and that kind of became our thing. And with the steel and the RPMs of the machine, I could compress the wood much more than I ever could with the bone, um, from before. So now we're compressing the wood, in my opinion, more than any other company was compressing the wood um, and kind of started out with this steel burnishing uh, process. And that kind of became our kind of calling card. Um, and so the next thing I realized after dealing with different uh, mills and where we're getting our wood from was hand split wood was a, is a huge advantage in, in getting straight grains in each bat. So when wood is produced, right, these mills are taking a log, cutting it into sections, and then most mills at the time are running them through 
uh, sauce to, yeah. to get like these four by four kind of blanks and then they dry it out and then they kind of round it into what you kind of see behind us today. Um, when you hand split wood, that splitting process finds the straight grain in wood and it'll ride along that, gra that grain. When you cut wood, you could be cutting across the straight grain and then you, that's when you start seeing bats like blow up on TV. Ah. So um, it definitely makes a harder, more durable um, and more consistent quality bat by using hand split wood. So those two things, using only hand split wood and steel burnishing kind of became our calling card from the days I was still in my garage before I ever made a bat for a major league player. And those two things are still like our tried and true method and, and what every bat that goes out of here has those two things in it. It has, starts with hand split wood and they all get steel burnished for, to make sure the bats are as hard as possible. And I would imagine that hand split wood is also more expensive it's definitely to... <laughs> harder. It's definitely uh, more time consuming for them to make. So yeah. it's definitely more expensive, yeah. And, you know, knowing that when you're growing a business, and especially with the last year, with all of the challenges with supply chain, has that affected, especially we've heard about wood within the housing market and building new houses, has that also affected wood prices for you? Definitely. Definitely makes things challenging in today's market. Um, it, it, it was a little bit more of a delayed uh, price increase on our end. Mm -hmm. Like when all that stuff was happening with, you know, we everybody heard of like the prices of two by fours at Home Depot. And when that was happening, we weren't seeing a huge effect on the wood we were getting. But after that, I'd say about last November to present day, uh, our wood prices have increased tremendously. So that's definitely a big um, hurdle for us to overcome, especially in a market where the market will only sustain so much for a wood bat, right? It's a product that can break, yeah. right? So anybody making a solid wood bat, no one can make an unbreakable bat. As we try to take as much possibility out that's gonna break by using hand split wood and that kind of stuff. Um, but there's no one can make an unbreakable wood bat. Somebody's throwing hard enough and you swing hard enough and you hit it on the wrong part of the bat, there's a good chance it's gonna break. So therefore the market is only gonna sustain so much of a, of a price increase. Um, you know, composite bats, aluminum bats get sold every day for $400. No one's going to buy a $400 wood bat. So that mm -hmm. kind of, we're kind of always butting up against that ceiling mm -hmm. um, and profit margins. And, you know, when you start talking about like the business side of the, of the business, um, you know, those things get tough, you know, because you're obviously we have to make a profit in what we do or we won't be here for long. So, right. um, so that becomes challenging um, to, you know, but at the end of the day, we always want to give our customers the best product possible um, so that they know when they swing a Tucci bat, um, they're getting the quality that I set out to give them back in the days I was still making them in my garage. So let's talk about a little bit about the challenges as you've grown the business and you've moved into a bigger facility, which is awesome. And there's batting cages behind us, which you might be able to hear in the background. <laughs> um, so it's an all in one kind of facility, but tell me about a couple of the challenges that you've come across as you've grown and scaled your business. Um, there's been a lot, I'll be honest with you. And, <laughs> and, and in all honesty, you know, people kind of, I guess, give me credit for taking the chance and doing this. Uh, if I knew the challenges going into it, I probably would have shied away from doing it in all honesty. <laughs> I think the uh, greenness of it all for me and, and the not knowing led to a little bit of bravery. Mm. Um, but um, there is a lot of challenges uh, in, in the wood bat business. One, you're competing against just giants in the industry. Right. I mean, Louisville Slugger has been the name in wood baseball bats. I since, even know who Louisville Sluggers are. Since the 1800s. So, so if you ask, <laughs> if, if there's any one company that anybody knows on wood baseball bats, it's yeah. Louisville Slugger, right? There's other companies out there, Marucci and uh, Old Hickory and, and other companies that have kind of gained a lot of notoriety. Um, you know, Marucci's pretty much become another Louisville Slugger. They're a monster in the industry. So, you know, setting out to make bats for major players when you're sitting in your garage, knowing you're going up against companies that have very, very deep pockets. And, yeah. um, you know, that's challenging in itself. Um, outside of that, um, you know, getting players to trust in you, getting players to believe in you, 
um, getting the credibility of Major League Baseball players behind you uh, is definitely challenging. We, again, hit the ground running mm -hmm. in, in that aspect, so we lucked out. But when that happened, I kind of was anticipating like, oh, like all, all big box offices got to start using this now. I mean, we have mm. five players in the World Series. We have a bat in, in the Hall of Fame. Like, how come Dix is not <laughs> knocking at my knocking door? Knocking at my door. Right. <laughs> uh, but that's not how it works. There's a lot of marketing that they want to see behind your product. Mm -hmm. um, we had zero sales reps around the country, right? I think at the time I had one sales rep. Um, and we were very heavily focused on major league and minor league players at the time. Yeah. It was very hard to kind of keep up with anything else. So um, it takes time to kind of build that up. Uh, and that was like one of my earliest biggest struggles was getting the rest of the business to sustain the MLB business. Um, like MLB should be probably about 5% of your overall business. For years, it was probably 50 or 60% of our overall business. So, wow. um, so that to me was, was a big challenge of, of how do I get this mainstream? Um, a lot of marketing, you know, like marketing behind it. And like, that's, that's not easy hitting on the right thing. Burns up money very fast. So, I mean, that to me was like a big challenge. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to learn a little bit more about Tucci Lumber. Welcome back to the business of Baseball Bats. We're here with Pete Tucci of Tucci Lumber, and we are going to learn a little bit more about, um, you know, I would love to hear about the turning point where you realized that this was a viable, that you guys were gonna make it as a company. Um, so in 2014, 2014, uh, we needed capital to kind of expand, right? We're kind of getting to that point where um, it was tough to be profitable because we were getting big enough to a point where, um, you know, we either needed to get bigger or make the decision to kind of stay smaller. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of at that time made a decision to get, to get bigger. You know, we thought we can do more, especially again, with the amount of notoriety we were getting within MLB, um, to kind of take that more mainstream and get more into the retail space and, and that area. So, uh, we kind of needed capital to kind of expand into a bigger place. And so we set out looking for strategic partners to take on that not only would bring in the capital needed, but also um, kind of bring us like that marketing that we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so we had two MLB players at the time who were interested in signing a, an exclusive deal with us. Um, at that point, one, we didn't have the extra cash to pay them to use our bats. Two, they'd never want to be uh, a business decision that we made, right? We wanted mm -hmm. people to use our bats because they felt it was the best for their game and, mm -hmm. and, and was going to help their career and that kind of stuff, not because we were writing them a check to use our bats. So um, the two players you know, at the time were Troy Tulowitzki, who at the time was on the Rockies, Pablo Sandoval, who was on San Francisco Giants. They were both using mm -hmm. our bats. <laughs> They're both using our bats and, uh, and, and wanted to sign an exclusive deal. And then we kind of talked into, um, you know, we thought it would be a better arrangement for everybody if they would be willing to invest in the company. Uh, they both agreed and that kind of capital allowed us to kind of move into the facility we're in currently today. Um, they became minority partners in the business. Um, and so that kind of, that was like a big like feather in our cap, like, all right, like, now we have some kind of steam going, you know, we have even more credibility than just MLB players using our bats is MLB players willing to invest in the company and kind of put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, to kind of propel the company forward. So that was a, a, a big, big turning point for us. That's huge. That was huge. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me about a time when you took a gamble on something and it turned out better than you thought it was going to. Uh, Beyond your wife's painting skills in the yeah, back, like yeah. clearly that was. Yeah, the whole thing has been, I feel like I've just been like shooting from the hip from, from day one, but um, let's see, big gamble I take. Um, man, there's been a lot. I feel like they're all, I feel like every day has just been a gamble. <laughs> um, so in 2017, we were, we're in the new facility, but we needed to up our production. So we were looking to bring in a new, a new lathe 
Okay. Um, the lathe we're looking at cost two hundred sixty thousand dollars and was coming from Italy. Um, at that time, we were talking to a company uh, owned by Bodden Sports called Axbats. So Axbats has its patented axe handle, uh, which studies show that it, it improves your swing path by about ten percent, uh, having like longer time in the zone, and uh, it increases on average about 4% bat speed. So a lot of players were starting to gravitate towards it. It's definitely uh, a kind of a feel thing. Some players don't like it because they're very traditional. It's very new, unique feeling, um, you know, especially when you grew up an entire life playing with, with a handle one style. Mm -hmm. But a lot of players did give it a try and, and liked it. Axbats want, you know, came to us to license out their product and start using it on our bats. Uh, the problem was we had to send our wood to another company. They would cut the handle into the bat, send it back to us, put it on our machines to cut the rest of the bat, and then we'd finish it. So logistically, to me, it didn't make a lot of business sense because there was just a lot of cost spent in just getting all, all that between shipping. Yeah. and um, Not to mention if at the end of the day, you make that bat and there's a knot in it and it goes into like a firewood pile. So. Um, <laughs> So I kind of went back to them and said, if, if I'm able to make this that in, in a one pass system where we can just put it on the lathe, uh, kind of cut the whole bat and, and would you consider giving us not only the license, but your manufacturing rights and then we'll manufacture all, all your bats. And so we negotiated price. I talked to Italy, the company we we're looking at with the mm -hmm. machine to see if there is even something they can do. And together they, you know, we kind of, made the system of, of what we currently have here. Um, and that kind of landed us that deal. So we then took over all the manufacturing rights for all Axbats. So um, that's been a pretty good deal for us over the years. Uh, and that's kind of a, a, a gamble to kind of get that machine. And it kind of, actually that deal helped us get that machine because having that contract is what landed us the, the lending for the machine itself. So. Makes sense. Wow, what a really cool story. Um, and are those the, is that handle the one that's like kind of like a little bit angled and looks almost like a triangle yeah, at the bottom? Yeah, you see yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's just like, a, like, yeah. a, like an axe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell me about a time when you took a gamble that turned into a learning opportunity and didn't pan out the way you might have wanted um, it to. Probably when we tried to get into gloves okay. uh, a few years ago. So um, again, I, I think about a lot of the time I had thinking making bats by hand when it went, you know, before I had all the CNC machines and back in my garage. And one of my ideas was to, okay, beyond wood bats, if this ever takes off, where, what's the next logical step? Yeah. At that time, I thought gloves would be a next, next logical step. And, you know, we kind of started as Tucci lumber. We were going to expand into Tucci leather. Um, ah. And so we started making custom gloves. Talked to a uh, manufacturer out of China and, and the gloves are being all made overseas. Um, and it was definitely a, a learning experience. I wouldn't consider it a total failure because I thought the product was good, but it just never really took off. Uh, again, there's just a lot of capital involved in kind of getting that line going. Uh, much like the batch you're dealing with giants in the industry with like Rawlings and Wilson and Mizuno. So it's very tough to change people's perception on, on that. Bats, it's a little bit easier because it's, more of a frequent purchase than a glove mm. so people are willing to try something new and if they don't like it they'll just go back to what, what they like if they do like it they tend to stick with you with gloves it's a little bit different that's like a yearly to you know bi-yearly purchase so for most people they kind of wanted to stick with what they what they knew and what they liked so it's kind of tough getting into that world um again i, I did like the product we were coming up with mm -hmm. but ultimately just didn't really work out and and we decided to uh for the time being concentrate on the offensive side of the ball and we may look into the future uh again getting back to kind of being that all inclusive baseball brand uh but for the next year or two we'll continue to kind of focus on the offensive side of baseball cool we're going to take one more quick break and then we're going to learn more about the offensive side of baseball <laughs> So 
So welcome back to the business of baseball bats. And actually, we're going to talk not just baseball bats, but more about the offensive side of baseball, something I am learning about. Um, so yeah, tell me how you're working on expanding the Tucci name into other areas of baseball. So a few years ago, uh, we were approached by a company called Shut Sports, who is very big into the football world. Okay. Um, so most, most people know them in, in that area, and they make one of the best helmets on the football side. They also had a baseball line or, or have a baseball line of, of products, mostly stemming from the protective world that they do in, in football. Makes sense. Batting helmets, catcher's equipment. Um, so we kind of went into a deal with them where we're now taking over their line of baseball products uh, under the Tucci brand. Mm -hmm. um, but we've kind of made the internal decision to kind of step away from like the catcher's equipment, the defensive side, and very and heavily focus on the offensive side. Obviously us kind of bringing that, the baseball sense of, of, of starting in the wood bats, having that MLB presence, um, and them kind of their biggest product to date on their side has been the batting helmet. So stemming off of those two products to really focus in on like the offensive side of baseball, right? So we're gonna own the batter's box. We're gonna come up with the best bats, the best batting helmets, um, protective gear, uh, batting gloves, uh, and really focus on what we feel we do best uh, for the next couple of years. And then maybe down the line, um, kind of, again, step into kind of that defensive side of gloves and, and catcher's equipment and that. But for now, um, you know, we're, we're in the process of producing uh, our first line of composite bats and BB core bats. So we'll have two two BB core bats, uh, two U-Triple-S-A composite bats, and one fast pitch women's softball bat. That will be launching uh, early 2023. And so what is the difference for those people who aren't super into baseball or baseball bats? Like why would you use a composite bat over um, one of your um, hand wood bats. wood bats? So most of the leagues outside of professional baseball mm -hmm. um, play with aluminum or composite bats. It's been common practice since I think the late 70s to early 80s where kind of aluminum bats kind of hit the scene to, you know, obviously wood bats break, right? So, mm -hmm. so the initial introduction of aluminum bats 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, <laughs> I can't even do math that bad. But. So uh, was really stemmed around saving wood, right? Mm -hmm. Not going through that many, you buy one bat, it's going to last for years. Mm. And that kind of generally was the case until engineers got involved and started realizing that they can really kind of produce a outperforming bat, right? And so then you had this like huge kind of era of just ungodly numbers. If you look at like college baseball, like the numbers they're putting up with some of these bats. So then NCAA and, and like they started kind of putting in these, um, regulations on the bat so you had to kind of stay within parameters of like what a wood bat can can produce so now you have like in high school and college called bb core so bb core bats are aluminum or composite bats but they can't exceed a certain standard ah, so there's okay. testing that happens that to make sure the ball exit speed is not more than what can typically be produced by a wood bat but you still get the benefits of you know you probably not going to break it. Not, mm -hmm. not that they, I mean, there are instances where aluminum and composite bats break, but obviously at a way reduced rate than what wood bats are breaking at. So, so that's kind of the benefit of it. And, and now in all honesty, that's the biggest business in the sport it ah. is, uh, is th this line of like BB core composite baseball bats. So, um, we're taking our expertise of what we know, in wood bats and in baseball mm -hmm. and marrying that with a couple of engineers who are already under our umbrella on the football side but have come from the baseball world um, and we're trying to take our hand at producing one of the best composite bats and see if we can recreate what we did on the wood side on the aluminum composite side. Cool, wow, very very exciting stuff coming for Tucci Lumber. So really exciting to see how you guys continue to grow and take over the baseball world. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great.